you to put yourself in my position. So I've been stuck in Japan since 1985. Okay? I never left. I came on a Pan American Airlines. I still have my return ticket. So I guess I'm stuck. All right? It's not a joke. Okay, but you know, my job, you know, as the strategist for Japan is basically to sell Japan to the rest of the world. Okay, and as you know, money moves very fast, money knows no borders, you can invest wherever you want to, right? And money is pretty ruthless because you can see a result. I mean, either your investment goes up or it goes down, right? So it's kind of tough, right? Not every investor in the world is as yasashi, right? As kind as the Japanese are, right? So, you know, a couple of years ago, I walk into a meeting somewhere in Texas, and the guy looks me in the eye and basically says, so, why should I put my money in Japan? You got 30 seconds and one data point. So I want you to close your eyes and just think about it. You got what is the strongest point about Japan? Why should you put your saving into investing in Japan? It's a wonderful thing. Think about it. What's your answer? What's the most powerful thing? You've got 30 seconds. What's the most powerful thing that Japan has to offer? Why is Japan better than the rest of the world? What do you answer? Um, research, investment. research and investment. What about you? Which one? Politically stable. It's not Hong Kong, right? Okay, what do you think? Strong technology. What about you? The people. Okay, well, there's, uh, there's people everywhere, right? No, no, no. I think uh, Japanese people, the working culture is uh, different than the rest of the world. Personally, I think I would invest here. Right. Because of hard working people they have. Okay, so it's the Japanese and the Germans, right? <laughs> that's the two people you would invest in, right? You got one, well, you know, that's obviously true. There's obviously something. We all live in Tokyo. We love living in Tokyo. It's a fantastic place to be, right? But I mean, there's successful companies everywhere in the world, right? I mean, you can go to, you know, Africa and find some very powerful, very successful, you know, entrepreneurs and business people, right? But I take your point. So there's something about Japan. What about you? What, 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 what would you answer? Stability, okay. What about you? Right. Okay. Still, the so it's it's linked to a high growth area. That's kind of what you what you you know. But if it's linked to a high growth area, why don't I just invest in Indonesia, for example? Right. Okay. There is no perfect answer, right? Obviously, to the whole thing. But my answer, right? sort of goes along the lines of, you know, what some of you have alluded at. This to me is the most powerful data point I think you have on Japan, structurally. And this is exactly as you pointed out, this is research and development, right? Research and development spending is a share of national income. It's 3.4% in Japan. It is by far the highest that you've got anywhere in the advanced industrial world. Now, You've got Israel at 5%. I actually think Israel is a lot like Japan. It's a relatively small country. It's no longer a big country, right? And the only power that you have is your intellect, right? No matter what the quality of the people is, what the manners are, you've got to invest in the future. And what is interesting is that you can see that throughout the 1990s, throughout you know, the last generation, Structurally, this share has actually increased rather than decreased, which tells you that Japanese companies have continued to invest in the future. They've continued to invest in research and development. Okay? So, very, very interesting. A couple of other facts, if you look at the details here. Of this 3.4% of GDP, in Japan, 82% is done by private companies. In America, for example, basically 50% is done by the government. It is effectively the military-industrial complex, which you and I cannot invest in. Right? We can hope for some spin-off in the future, but it's very difficult to actually directly invest in this. While here in Japan, 
of this investment in the future, you actually find you know, that it is private companies, so whether it is Murata Sesak Show or whether it is GRI, you can actually participate and invest in those companies. All right? So that, I think, is very, very important. The third detail that you've got is when you look at the breadth of investments, it is across all industries. You've got this guru for competitiveness, Michael Porter, right? And you know, about nine years ago, 10 years ago, we were on a panel discussion together, and he sort of flipped and sort of said, ah, oh, yes, bro, come on, Japan, 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 Japan hasn't invented anything since the Sony Walkman. Now, I asked, so what car do you drive? They said, oh, I drive a Lexus. <laughs> well, point taken, right? I mean, consumer electronics, obviously, you know, I was the Sony generation. My children don't know what Sony is. I mean, that's obviously not true, but basically it's all, you know, the Korean companies, etc. But if you look at the breadth of investment, the breadth of patent technology that Japan actually has, it is very, very broad. Whether it is pharmaceuticals, whether it is machinery, whether it is tires, whether it is uh, you know, components, it is across the entire breadth. And that's one of the things about the country, because when you invest in a country, right, you've got one company, one you know, sector where the, company, where the country is very, very good at. What is amazing about Japan is that it's very broad. Right? There is not a monotsukuri, there's not a manufacturing sector where the Japanese are not contenders for top tier in the world in terms of innovation, in terms of fundamental competitiveness. And you can see concrete results of this actually everywhere where you look. So let me give you one example which I think is stunning, which is a very unsuspecting industry. This is shipbuilding. Shipbuilding is 19th century. This is old style. But look at this. Yes, you know, at the beginning of this millennium, you had the, at the beginning of this century, you had, oh, at, the, <laughs> at the beginning of this century, you had, uh, you know, China taking market share from the Japanese. This is the global market for shipbuilding, right? But what have you seen is that over the last three years, Japan is actually gaining back and China is going down. Now, Korea is a very, very powerful competitor, no question about that. Why the flip? What happened? Quality. Quality? Okay, nice ship. I used to work on them, and they always complained. The quality was so bad, they had to take it from China to somewhere else to fix all the problems. We like this man. Very good. <laughs> what happened in shipping? Quality is good. What happened with shipbuilding is two things. The first one is ships are expensive to run. The basic cost factor, right, is bunker oil. And bunker oil structurally has increased, and it's very difficult to find somebody who argues that structurally energy prices or oil prices are going to start to be coming down. So the cost of running a ship has gone up. So you and I wanting to run a ship, buying a ship, developing a ship, we want something that is as energy efficient as possible, right? The second thing that has happened is Kisekyoka. So there was a tightening of rules and regulation because what? Ships stink. I mean, it's a huge CO2 emissions that comes from ships. And there were global rules and regulations that actually got tightened up. If you want to sail in international waters, right, you've got to meet standards. So the Japanese, you know, continue to invest in the future. And they're building eco ships, which is essentially like a Prius, right? So they are very energy efficient. Japanese paint companies have developed paint just using that paint, your efficiency of running the ship goes up by about 10%, which is huge, right? So the point about this, right, is that Japan has continued to invest in, the, in innovation, even in old sectors. I mean, many would have said shipbuilding. Why would you want to be in shipbuilding? But the Japanese kept on innovating, kept on investing in it, right? And you're starting to see the fruits of this thing coming forward. Smartphones. You have one? Yeah. What do you have? I, iPhone. Good. Which one? Uh, six plus. Six plus. Yeah. How did you get that? Uh, you have connections. I, I found my iPhone 5 and I'm using one right there. Six plus. Okay. And how long did you have to wait? No, I just wanted to <laughs> How did you? Um, we need to talk to her. <laughs> so she, she is obviously somebody good to know. How many of you have an iPhone? 
mean, look, the first iPhone, right, was a big shock for Japan. What percentage of components was made by Japanese companies? It was less than 10%, right? The new thing, what do you have plus? I don't know about the plus. That's the thing that bends, right? You sit on it. That's, that's, that's the one, right? Yeah, okay, good. Is it? Yeah? My wife is getting one. I, I'm, I'm, I'm old fashioned. I want one of these flip things. You know? <laughs> Speed me up, Scott. Um, so, God, I'm glad you can still get that joke. That's amazing. I'm not that old. Uh, sorry. No, but the point being that, you know, the first iPhone was a big shock for Japan. Less than 10% of the components were made by Japanese companies. The new iPhone, we reckon about 60% of the components are made by Japanese companies. And when you talk to engineers, right, the technology, the specification, the quality, you know, that you need as you get more powerful and smaller and more touch sensitive, right, a lot of the stuff is actually, can only be made by Japanese corporations, right? So it's very, very interesting. We reckon, by the way, of that 60% of the value of the components, right, that is made by Japanese companies, we reckon that actually made in Japan, is only about 20%. Made by Japan is about 60%. So for example, the lens is made by Sony, but the lens is de facto manufactured at a Sony factory in Korea, right? But it's Sony technology. So, you know, you've got something very, very interesting here. And again, in terms of, you know, maintaining your competitive edge, it is exactly the research and development that really drives things forward very, very much, okay? So in my opinion, that's the most powerful thing that Japan has, this constant focus on innovation, all right? So this discussion, and here it is, you know, getting bored, because that was exactly what I said two years ago, five years ago, eight years ago, I mean, this, you know, I'm sorry, I'm old, right? This is my strong point on Japan. Fortunately, the chart, you know, keeps on improving, and fortunately, there's more and more sectors where Japan is actually improving very rapidly, right? So that's interesting, but what has changed? Now we are in the autumn of 2014, right? What is different right now? And I want to leave you with one thing, right? In economics or in you know, business or in finance, you, know, you learn a lot about sort of process, right? And you learn certain rules of economics, right? You know, you say the interest rate goes up, investment goes down, or the interest rate goes down, investment goes up, certain things like that. But actually, what drives an economy? What drives an entrepreneur? Something like this, right? It's actually how do you awaken? When you work in a team, how do you excite the team that they actually follow you? That's the key. If you can do that, you're golden. You see, Japanese girls' soccer team, they can do that. Japanese guys' soccer team, they cannot do that. <laughs> Which is not surprising since they had an Italian coach. You know, but, you're from Italy? Anybody? What? I'm German. Excuse me. This year, this year you cannot argue with me. But what? What is different this time, right? And I want to leave you with three items, right? That I think are fundamentally different, right? This time around, okay? And I can say that because I've been stuck in Japan for 30 years, right? So the first thing that is different is that Japan now has a common enemy. And I don't say this lightly. People look at Prime Minister Abe, where did this guy come from? Nobody predicted that he would come back to power. Why did he come back to power? Because of his nationalist credentials. Remember, it was six months after the Senkaku issue started to flare up, right? And you know, he's got, and his team has got very strong, deep-rooted, nationalist you know, ideas. So what has changed is that now Japan has a common enemy. And I'm sorry, I speak very bluntly, but I can do that, I'm a guy right? Um, Japan now has a unifying rifle. It's their rival, rival. It's very clear Japan does not want to become a colony of the People's Republic of China. By the way, economic interchange, economic threat, economic opportunity, the Japanese and the Chinese have embraced a long, long time ago, right? If you look at the interaction, if you look at the density of capital flows, the density of people flow, right? Uh, the density of trade between China and Japan, it has surpassed the density, the degree of interaction that we had between Germany and France 
in the 1970s and 1980s, which was the height of European integration. So if you objectively look at the economic integration, it is absolutely spectacular. China is Japan's largest trading cut partner, both for exports as well as for imports. And of the imports, about two-thirds of all the imports from China are what is called captured imports, Yaku Union. These are manufactured by Japanese transplants, by Japanese joint ventures in China, pulling the product back into Japan. So it's very, very interesting, you know, the nexus, the opportunity of China, the challenge of China as an economic, as a business opportunity, the Japanese have fully embraced. But when you talk about, these are my islands, no, they're not. However stupid that may seem, however trivial that may seem, this is a big issue. And all of a sudden, everything has changed. And what it does do, it actually unifies the Japanese elite. Okay, I want to do something, sorry, since we, we've got a casual group. Is that okay? Or are you guys bored? No? Okay. Because I tell you, you know, what's the greatest thing about Japan? Brian, how long have you been here? 10 years. 10 years. What's the worst thing about the Japanese? Um, the girls. Tatemai. Huh? Tatemai. Tatemai. Oh, we don't have that in America. It's Okay, okay, good. Okay, Okay, what, what do you think? Who, who wants to volunteer? What's the worst thing about Japan? You don't have to. I can tell you. <laughs> what do you think? You're Japanese? Yeah. What do you think? Okay, Atto, you want me to eat one? Okay. You see, the Japanese, they, you, that's the worst thing. Why don't you guys do it? When they're training, they don't stop bitching. It's amazing. Uh, no, I know from an economist's perspective, or from an investor's perspective, or from a business perspective, get they know the good. The Japanese don't design. It takes forever to design. It's unbelievable. You know, I go to an investor in America, I, if I have a convincing story, seriously, within half an hour they change their entire asset allocation. Right? In Japan, this takes a year. Right? So, you know, that's sort of kete noriku. But what happened, the reason I make this point is because I have a rival. Right? Because I don't want to become a colony of China. Right? Because of that, the ruling elite of Japan is unbelievably united. I, in my 30 years, have not seen the ruling elite, whether it is the business community, the financial community, the political community, the bureaucratic community, or the media. I have not seen them as united as they are right now. They get things done. And by the way, since I don't want to, you're Chinese, I assume. Uh, yeah. Okay, no, that's, look, hey, you know, that's okay. Where are you from? From New York City. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to buy you a drink. Okay. Now, you know, it's also America's biggest friend. America is ruthless. These guys look at numbers, they look at forecasts, and they actually act on these things. By the time of the Tokyo Olympics, by 2020, the population of the Philippines is going to be larger than the population of Japan. So I'm an American. My job is to figure out who is my ally, who is my power play in Asia Pacific. It is true that the Japanese economy has stagnated. It is true that Japan has had deflation. It is true that Japan hasn't contributed very much to global economic growth. It is true that Japan's population is declining. So America is also putting a very, very strong tick here. And you can see, for Japan, there's a decision to be made. Does Japan desire to continue to be a top-tier country? This is very important, right? So you've got the pressure from the People's Republic of China, which unites, and you've got the pressure from the United States of America, which also unites. So as a result of that, all of a sudden, things get done, right? So it's fantastic, you know, to actually have this sort of animal spirit, so to speak, right, uh, that actually galvanizes things. And I think in political terms, you know, that is sort of one of the big things have. So you've got a united elite. The other thing that you have, 30 years in Japan, since 1985, how many prime ministers in Japan since 1985, which is 30 years ago, how many prime ministers have been in power for more than two years? Two. Nakasone and Koizumi. Everybody else, you blinked, and they were gone. Now, I will tell you something else. As a business person, as an investor, as an entrepreneur, actually, I don't care about politics. 
I have to deal with politicians, right? But do I think Mr. Obama has the right policy? Oh no, it's the other guys, the Republicans who do the right policy. We can debate this and people get very emotional about it, but as an investor, I actually don't care. All I need to know is that whoever is in power sticks with his cause, sticks with his promises, and has the staying power to actually deliver. And the problem is, if every year there's a new boss, you can't act on it. What is your tax policy? What is your labor law policy? What is your regulatory policy? What is your monetary policy? It flip-flopped all the time, right? Whether you like Mr. Abe or not, again, I'm reasonably indifferent, but they are very likely to stick around for at least another three years, possibly until the Olympics in 2020, right? Which is great, because when you look at the policy that is being announced here, this is extremely pragmatic. What's the basic policy? What was the symbol that they picked? Anybody know? right? So it's the three arrows. What are the three arrows? Okay, womenomics. That's, a, that's not an arrow. That's reality. That is good. So the guys can retire. Fantastic. We like this. I'm a big fan of womenomics, right? What are the three arrows? Come on. Monetary policy, fiscal policy, and structural policy, right? And the point about, the, you know the metaphor that he used, right? Why did he talk about three arrows? It's not that you fire the arrow, right? It is one arrow you can break. Two arrows you can still break. But if you have three arrows, you can't break them. So it's the coordination. It is the pragmatism. There is no one magic bullet. If I do this, everything is going to be fine. That's not the point. What I need is coordination. There are a lot of issues that require a lot of tools. And that's exactly what Abenomic promises, great policy pragmatism. So monetary policy, fiscal policy, and regulatory policy. In the Q&A, if you want to talk about this with them, we can, we can do this. Look at what they've done. They are very pragmatic. Public investment, the budget deficit, is actually increasing. I'm from Germany. In Germany, you go, oh my god, you must never increase your fiscal deficit. Let's squish France and, <laughs> and nobody here from Europe. Where are you from? Denmark. You're from Denmark. That's the good part. That's like, <laughs> the Danish, they can't do anything wrong. This is like amazing, right? No, but you know, very, very pragmatic. Despite a high fiscal deficit, they're fine. You know, we're going to raise taxes, so we need to buy some insurance by having supplementary spending packages, right? Monetary policy, they're also very aggressive, um, you know, in terms of uh, increasing the monetary base. And you see some success, right? You see that, and I'm sorry, I'm selfish here, this is for my day job. You see that profits of listed companies is, has actually been increasing very, very smartly. And you also see that, you know, the overall money economy is actually beginning to work as well. There is a credit cycle that actually has started to come in. The labor market has started to turn up. I mean, people forget the unemployment rate has fallen from 5% to 3.5% here in Japan. This is a different indicator in the percentage of high school graduates who actually find a job. And you can see that that's at the highest level in almost 30 years, right? So there is a turnaround, you know, that is actually coming. And you actually do find that despite all this nationalist rhetoric, right, what was one of the first things that the Abe administration did? They changed the visa regulation. Right? So now people from ASEAN and people from the People's Republic of China, right? it is much, much easier to come right, to Japan, which is fantastic. Right? So that's sort of where there is great pragmatism you know, that the overall system actually has. The other thing is that actually there is a lot of inflation. I mean, it's not your fault, it's not my fault. Two years ago, prices were falling by 1%. Today, prices are increasing by 3%. Actually, also, Japan has now the lowest interest rates in real terms, you know, in the world. For the last 30 years, Japan and Switzerland had the highest real interest rates, right? That's a big change that actually, you know, has happened in the system here, okay? So, first point, you've got this united elite. 
They want to get their act together because of America pressure, because of China pressure, and they are very pragmatic. The nice thing about the Japanese, they are not religious. Sorry. No, the nice thing about the Japanese, they have no fundamental view right, on how things should be done. Right? So they're very, very pragmatic. So that's the political dimension. That's the big driver. That's the yashi. Right? That's the animal spirits that are back in the system. Okay? In economic terms, what is different? What is different in economic terms? When people talk about economics these days, what do they talk about? They talk about central banks, right? Is the Bank of Japan going to ease again? Is Mr. Janet Yellen going to increase interest rates? Is the ECB going to buy more government bonds, right? This is not economics. This is money policy. Money does not create wealth. Money does not create prosperity. If I increase the allowance, the weekly allowance of my son, from 2,000 yen to 4,000 yen, that is not going to increase his chances of getting into Tokyo University or into Harvard, right? Oh, he may be having a little bit more fun, but uh, you know, then, <laughs> never mind that, right? So real economics is the allocation of scarce resources, right? The first report I ever wrote about Japan was called Capitalism Without Cost. There was no cost of capital in Japan. The cost of equity was very low, and the cost of debt was very, very low as well. There's no credit market, right, in Japan, right? And you can show that, you know, compared to the rest of the world, right, you read a lot about that the ROE and the ROA of Japanese companies is much lower than it is in the rest of the world. Well, that means that the cost of capital, right, return, equal cost, same thing, right? And so that's actually what's happening. This is what has changed in Japan right now. Japan now has real shortages, okay? Number one, Japan is now a deficit nation. This is a turn in the trade deficit. I was born in 1961. This is relevant because the wine from 1961 is extremely good. I like wine. But it is also relevant because since 1961, every year Japan ran big surpluses. Now they run a deficit. Why did they turn from surplus to deficit? So people say, well, more imports. More, <laughs> very good. More imports. Yes, more imports. So people say it's because of the nukes, right? Oh, they switched off the nuclear power plants. And as a result of that, the energy bill for imports has increased very dramatically. That is extremely interesting, but I urge you to look a little bit at the facts. When you actually look at the imports of coal, gas, and oil, right, you find that in volume terms, they have not increased, which is quite remarkable. You switch off 30 nuclear power plants, right, and your energy import volume actually does not increase. What did increase is the price, because the yen weakened, so the dollar becomes more expensive. All these energy prices are dollar denominated, so the import bill in yen terms actually increased quite a bit, right? But you see that the actual increase in imports in, Jap in Japan, right, of the 11%, sorry, of the 15% increase in imports over the last three years, right? What you find is only, you know, only 4% was from energy. The rest is manufactured product, electrical machinery, machinery, manufactured goods, raw materials, etc., etc., right? So what's happening here is that you've got a structural change in imports, in the import penetration, that actually is going on. My analysts reckon that of that increase in manufactured imports, again, about two-thirds is Japanese companies pulling product back into Japan from their offshore production. So it's negative for GDP, but it's not negative for listed companies, right? So you've got this flip going on. Now, what does that mean? 
if you have this flip, and Japan is now a deficit country that you actually have, right? By the way, you see this as well. If you look at investment, right? Where do Japanese companies invest? You invest in Japan, or you invest outside of Japan. This is for listed companies, right? So companies that are listed on the stock exchange. And you find that basically, you know, they have done half inside Japan and half outside of Japan. But basically, over the last five years, now they're doing basically 100% of their investment is outside of Japan. Why is that? Why do you, how do you decide where to invest? You have, you, how many of you work for a manufacturing company? Girl from New York. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <I didn't... laughs> How do you decide where to build a factory? How do you do that? Do labor. Labor. Well, you're running a sweatshop. <laughs> Have you been to a factory lately? No. Okay, my friend, I went to at Kyoto University, right? He inherited a paperclip company. They make paper clips. I mean, that's the world's most simplest, one of the world's most simplest and most boring products. <laughs> he is the leading paperclip company. But very important. How many people in the factory? No. Two. There's two people. This is capital intensive. This is a robot, you know, that does this stuff, you know, and you have a guy who reads, you know, Flash magazine or something, right? Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. People talk about labor costs, right? And you and I running a service business, yeah, that's true. Labor cost is very important. If you and I run a hospital, my God, you know, for Horisan, you know, for, for Globus, it's labor cost. That's the only cost, right, that he's got, right? But a factory, I can build anywhere. It's the cost of capital that matters. What else matters? I want to be close to where my market is, right, because I want to minimize transportation costs so I don't have to ship stuff around. And by the way, if there's a tsunami or if there's a high flood, right, my supply chain gets disrupted, so I'm better off to be as close to my customer as I can possibly be, right? So the key issue is, you know, that actually Japanese companies are very, very rational. You look at profit margins, even with dollar yen at 105, the profit margin of a local factory in Japan compared to an international factory is about two times higher outside of Japan. So this year, Mazda became the last Japanese car company to begin produ producing outside of Japan. Right? They're, where did they go? Mexico. Correct. They went to Mexico. Right? So this year, they're going to produce 300,000 cars in Mexico for the American market, right? rather than shipping them from Hiroshima. Right? So that sort of you know, deindustrialization, that sort of hollowing out, you know, is one of the big reasons for why exports are not picking up, but most importantly, that you actually do have imports coming through. The other thing that you actually see in Japan as well, which is new, which is that there is actual closure of factories now. So the productive capital stock is actually finally being cut out. Right? And this is not a negative for the economy, because the unemployment rate has come down. So Mazda is not building a new factory in Hiroshima, right? It's building one in Mexico, which creates Mexican jobs, but it's not a negative for the Japanese economy anymore, right? Because there are other sectors where job creation um, you know, is, is actually happening here, okay? So, cost of cap, not cost of, sorry. So Japan is now a deficit country, and that deficit is here to stay. Okay, what does that mean for you? What does that mean for you? Okay, so that's a fact. Now you've got to think about what does that mean? What are the implications of that? What do you think? The first implication is a very practical one. Is that how do you forecast the exchange rate? I'm gone. How do you do that? How do you for put yourself in my position? I've got to forecast the exchange rate. Is it going up or is it going down? Well, if a country has a trade surplus, the currency is likely to be appreciating. So Japan always had a trade surplus, and indeed the yen appreciated all the way. Anybody know what the original value of the yen was? 
when MacArthur decided on the value of the yen, what was it? 360 yen, why? How did he, how did he come up with 360 yen to the dollar? Anybody remember? <laughs> no. Nope. He asked his translator and says, what does yen actually mean? And the guy says, maru, right? It means round. And so he said, okay, 360, 360 <laughs> degrees. I kid you not, that's how they picked it, right? <laughs> you know, the economists had forecast from like, I think from 80 up to 600. Completely useless, typical economist stuff, right? <laughs> you know, but the translator said, yes, it's maru. Sure, of course it's 360, right? You know, so 360, you know, we had, you know, one appreciator in Bretton Woods. When I arrived in Japan, it was at 260, right? Three months after I arrived in Japan, it went to 160. It was the Plaza Accord, right? And the yen has continued to appreciate all the way up to 75, right? As you remember a couple of years ago. Now, Japan is in a trade deficit, a big economic flip. That trade deficit is not Ichijiteki. It's not a one-off. This is likely to stay because of this offshore. So as a result of that, I can look you in the eye. The yen, for three generations, was an appreciating currency. Now it's going to be a depreciating currency. Right? So that's the number one implication. What's the number two implication? If you run a deficit, what happens? What happens when you run a deficit? You need money. You need to attract money. Right? If you have a surplus, right? You can squander. You don't need to be the best in the world. You don't need to have the highest rate of return. You can have a low cost of capital. Now, Japan needs to attract money. So you read a lot about stewardship codes, governance. You read about the National Pension Fund wanting to put pressure on companies to raise ROE, to raise ROA, right? That is a symptom of the economic dynamics, which means Japan now needs to attract capital. Let me be specific. When I say attract capital, let's look at the big markets, equities. Over the last six months, over the last 18 months, over the last two years, over the last five years, who has been the only net buyer of Japanese stocks? Global investors. Domestic investors, net over the last six months, 18 months, two years, five years, have been net sellers in the equity market, right? So already in the big capital market in, in, in equities, Japan very clearly is dependent on global capital, right? What about the, what's the other big capital market? You've got equity and you've got, what? Bonds, correct, government bonds, right? So government bond, what's the foreign ownership of government bonds? Japan has a lot of government bonds. There's a lot of debt out there. The foreign ownership two years ago was 5%. Today, it is 8.5%. Which again means that by definition, right, over the last two years, the only marginal buyer of government debt has been the foreigner which is very interesting. These are big changes in economics. And again, the driver is the fact that Japan actually now is running balance of payments deficits. Okay? So I'm extremely bullish on Japan because the return on equity, the return on debt, the return on capital <coughs> is now going to be increasing. Not because Mr. Abe says so. I have learned the hard way. I do not trust politicians, <laughs> which is, you know, Politicians, I think, are really cool. Politicians are the ultimate entrepreneurs. In a democracy, being a politician is really entrepreneurial. You put your job on the line every election. You lose your debt. It's kind of I mean, think of it that way, right? It's not like Germany, where, do you know in Germany, I mean, people complain about politicians. Anybody from Germany here? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Okay, uh, no, 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 in Germany, two-thirds of all parliamentarians are high school teachers. You know, I mean, is that, is that a good way to run a country? I don't know. <laughs> so now you know why Angela Merkel is so powerful, right? Um, but it's kind of interesting, you know, that you've got, you know, this thing. It's not the politicians. The politicians come from this China thing. 
focusing, leading, uniting, being pragmatic, right? The economics is number one, I now must attract capital. And global capital demands a global price. So I'm very bullish, right, on rates of returns in Japan, right? What's the second economic thing that has happened? The second economic thing that has happened is the fact that Japan is actually running out of labor. I mean, this is so cool, right? Okay, now I'm gonna tell you something. Sorry, I have to pick on my Chinese friend, right? So, when was this? Three years ago. And so we've got this, um, this son, right? We've got a son and a daughter. And the son, um, you know, at the time was 15, okay? And, uh, you know, he was going to the American school here in Japan. Right? And finally, you know, after a lot of pressure from a lot of parents, you know, they started a Chinese language program. Right? So the boy speaks reasonable Japanese, right? And goes to Japanese class, and they start with Chinese with Chinese. So mommy and daddy, right, sort of try and put a little pressure on the boy, right? And say, hey, you should do Chinese, right? Chinese. So, you know, we have this conversation. And he goes, Hey, Pops, how many Chinese. Oh, it's 1.3 billion. So, pups, in 10 years' time, is there going to be more or less Chinese people? Oh, there's going to be way more. You know, they have so many, just, you know, 1.5 billion, there'll be so many more, right? Okay. Pups, how many Japanese? Oh, there's about 126 million, right? What about in 10 years' time? In 10 years' time? God, they'll shrink, you know, there'll be way fewer of them. So the little rascal turns around and walks away and over his shoulder, shoulder says, Dad, you're an economist, I stick with Japanese. <laughs> and he is correct, sorry, no, <laughs> he is correct, because you want to be where there is scarcity. You don't want to be there is mass. You want to differentiate yourself. The only way you can differentiate yourself, right, is by being an Enka singer. No, sorry. It's the only way you can differentiate is that you've got to have something special, right? And, you know, Japanese speaking non Japanese are going to be in very high demand, right? So I think, you know, it's, it's kind of cool. So, from that perspective, the demographic thing, what is very cool about Japan is that the demographics is altering, right? Do you know the statistics? You can look at the data, it's, it's funny. If you extrapolate straight, straight out, you find that in 342 years, only 49 Japanese are going to be left. <laughs> and do you know that in Japan, there's actually, you know this, right? There's this big debate. They have this big debate. Is the last Japanese going to be a woman or a man? They, they, this, this is apparently terribly important, right? Um, so, you know, sorry. You can have a look at the world. And, you know, the scarcity in the labor market is real. It's not just the Kensetsu skill. It's not just the construction industry. I mean, you look at doctors, right? You look at security workers. You've got, yes, construction engineers, construction workers, waiters, nurses, drivers. I mean, this country has a shortage of about 700,000 nurses, right? So this is where you want to be, right? And so sooner or later, the price is actually going to start to be bid up. So, you know, I, I have this saying. I mean, I, 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 I gave a TED talk earlier this year, and I finally got to use my, the line I always wanted to use on stage, which is like, you know, I want to be reborn as a 23-year-old Japanese, right? Because <laughs> I think that's exactly right. Look, in the demographics, there's a lot of debate about the aging. Oh my God, the pensions, are they gonna be saved, right? It's like, what do you care? Whether your pension is okay. Your pension is not gonna be okay, so live with it, right? <laughs> so I'm gonna argue, hey, my pension should be okay, right? So the number of people who are 66 years and older every year between now and the Tokyo Olympics is going up by 430,000, right? But the number of people between 36 and 55 is going down every year by about 172,000. And this is where you want to be, the absolute sweet spot. 25 to 35 is going down by basically a quarter of a million people, right? So that's where the sweet spot is. So my thesis is, Japan is running out of labor. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Oh my god, it's terrible. No, it is fantastic, right? Because of this. The Japanese labor market, right, 
has fundamentally changed over the last 20 years, right? And this was the big change, right? Since the 1990s, this is the number of part-time workers, part or contract workers. That used to be 20% of people who get a paycheck at the end of the month. That has increased to basically 40%. Of the young generation, of the kids in their 20s up to 35, one in three people has never had a full-time job, right? Okay, that was terrible, that was pushy, it's a big change. But now that labor is in short supply, that labor is getting tight, what is going to happen? Answer, Japan is going to be the only country in the world. That's not true, I'm exaggerating, right? But still, my job. Japan is going to be the only advanced industrialized economy where there will be a new middle class. Because these people are now going to be arbitraged back. They're now going to be hired back on a full-time basis. And this is exactly what is beginning to happen. You have had fast retailing earlier this year rehire all their hisesha, all their part-time workers, onto a full-time basis. You had NTT rehire 5,000 of its part-time workers on a full-time basis. Aeon, yadida da. This is starting. And what does that mean? What is the difference between a part-time worker and a full-time worker in Japan? Anybody know? What's the difference? Come on. You're, you're going to be business people. You're going to think about this stuff. <laughs> okay, this is interesting. Because everybody, and this is the first thing every group says. It's like, ooh, you know, this, 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 you know, but look. So the pension, the difference in terms of the pension contribution, right, is only about 6%, right? What is interesting is that the base pay differential is only about 10%, right? It's not that much different, right? But what's the big difference? Well, look. There's, there's opportunity, you're right. I mean, you obviously have a career, right? That's, that's absolutely correct. Right? So that you see, you're, I like you, you're focused on the future. Where are you from? <laughs> Where? Tokyo. You are? <laughs> really? Which part of Tokyo? <laughs> <laughs> huh? The Osaka part of Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> West of Tokyo. So, funny, Nishinoka. So, the big difference is in Tokyo. Um, you know, but you've got this, uh, so you've got a career advancement, right? If you're a part-time worker, you're a part-time worker, right? But in money terms, what's the difference? Benefits are about 6%, it's not that much. And actually, it's not the democratic government actually, you know, increased the level. It used to be 15% difference, now 6%, right? So it's called lifetime security of income. Right? It's like, you know, you get a date. A part-time worker, you get a date. If a part-time worker, you ask someone to marry you, it's not going to happen. Right? The girls are smart. But the guys are stupid. I, mean, I don't know, something like that. What's the big difference? The difference is 40% in annual pay. Because a full-time worker gets a bonus, which in Japan gets paid twice a year. So the big difference, if I get rehired from part-time status to full-time status, my annual income effectively goes up by 50%. And that is huge, right? You've got the confidence factor, you've got the career advancement factor, right? You've got the security factor, but it's real money. So it's interesting, right now, what you actually see, I don't know whether you follow the sort of, you know, economic data stuff, right? But you find wages, the absolute level of wages is not increasing that much. It's increasing by about one and a half percent. Right? But you've got 3% inflation. Isn't that terrible? Right? But the number of people who get that base pay is currently increasing at a rate of about 180,000 every month. That is employment growth of about 3.5%. Japan is the biggest job creation machine in the OECD right now. So it's quite interesting. So my thesis is that you will have this new middle class. What else is the difference? So you get 50% more pay, what else do you get? Any of you work part-time? Maybe, you know, people who are working and start to work for full-time, they can, be, can go to loan. So that for them, they can create money. You 
were exactly right. As a part-time worker, you have no access to credit. I mean, you even, you know, you, you can't even get a credit card, right? And now that you've got a full-time job, mortgages in Japan effectively are priced off the bonus payment, right? So that's sort of one of the big difference, right? So this is my thesis. The labor market is tight. This is the buffer. It's very Japan-specific. These people will get arbitrage back. I make a prediction by the time of the Tokyo Olympics, you know, the number of part-time employees is going to be less than 25%, right? And that's where domestic demand. So that's, put yourself again, put yourself in my position. So that's a nice thesis. This sounds good, sounds sensible. How do I prove it that this is happening? I mean, I can wait for this to actually happen. But when labor market data turns around, way too late. Labor market is a lagging indicator of anything. So how do I prove it? I look at mortgage lending. Because if this is right, and there's a new generation of Japanese who until now lived with their parents because they couldn't afford, and they didn't have money, they didn't have access to credit. Now they can afford, they have access to credit. What should happen is that these people go out and buy an apartment, right? So bank lending, specifically mortgage lending, jutakuro, right? That's my leading indicator to verify whether my thesis is correct. I looked really good until about February this year because mortgage lending went from negative to positive, shot up very, very strongly. I think I've got the data somewhere. Ah, here it is. Huh, this was the next slide. Recently. So this is mortgage lending, you know, shot up very strongly, right? Now, this was 311, right? I mean, 311 took out a lot of homes. Right? So there was some release that happened here, but basically it broadened out. This is, you know, basically in February. Since February, it's stuck in this range. It sort of goes like this. It's no longer accelerating. So right now, I don't look so good. Right? I still have my thesis. There's other things that are happening. The Shuhize Zonze, right? The tax increase. You know, there's some uncertainty over tax policy on what happens on, on mortgages. There's a bit of saturation. So I'm not going to give up. But if in six months' time we meet again, and this thing is not re-accelerating, I'm going to have to reconsider, right? It's very important in my world, and the world of an analyst, if you have a thesis, this is what I think will happen because of this, this, this. Then, as an investor or as an entrepreneur, I want to know how do you show, how do you monitor whether this is true or not true? And so that's, you know, the little guide that I actually, that, that I actually look at, okay? So that's sort of the key thesis, I think, the way one should be looking at Japan. There's some deep-rooted fundamental changes. The first one is that the animal spirits are back. There's a focus, there's a united we need. The second one is that there's a shortage of capital, which means that Japan has to sweat its assets. And the third one is that you've actually got this shortage of labor, which means that Japan is going to sweat its labor assets more aggressively. So I'm very bullish on womanomics. Not because Mr. Abe is particularly enlightened. I mean, he is in this particular case, right? But the real driver, again, is the fact that there is this labor shortage that you've got overall in the system. So let me stop here. I hope that this is marginally clear, right? Let me stop and see whether you guys have any comments, any questions, you know, any specifics. You know, please don't be shy. Arigato. You're going to have to tell me who you are, where you're from, why you're here. My name is Maria. Um, I used to live in Los Angeles, California. Okay. I'm here because I'm a full-time student at Globus. Okay. And my question is, you talk about a labor shortage. And this is also a theme that's in the United States right now, is that there's a, it, there are no jobs, supposedly, for, for, for people coming out of college. But... So when you, when you say a labor shortage, are you talking about professional jobs, skilled labor? Because it's not manufacturing if that's not happening here. It's very interesting that you say that. You know, you've got, you know, so, so you've got, if you look at the sectors, you know, where are they? This thing here, right, is not going to be a manufacturing powerhouse, right? The number of people employed in manufacturing is going to continue to decline, right? Because Japanese manufacturing companies are creating jobs, you know, elsewhere. Um, but the jobs are created in the domestic economy, 
So it's all the way from, you know, uh, from nurses, the entire healthcare sector, right, all the way, you know, to Kitsui Kitanai Kiken, you know, the whole sort of, uh, you know, construction industry, for example, right? Um, and the whole palette in between, you know, they're running out of kindergarten teachers, they're running out of teachers, they're running out of engineers, they're running out of, you know, literally everything, right? So it's a slightly different problem from America, right? Because in the United States of America, you've got investment, companies are investing, right? But they are investing predominantly in capital intensive businesses, right? And, you know, the service sector, you know, there creates the job into, creates the job into an increasing labor force. My advantage is my labor force is not increasing. So do you think women are going to be able to fill those positions? Of course. Quickly? I hope so. I've been looking for a woman to take over for me. It's <laughs> very important. No, but, but, but look, I mean, skills are a funny thing. Skills are very funny. Oh, yes. I mean, I'm looking, I'm, I'm always looking for somebody who's better than me. Right? I can always complain about that, you know, my software engineer is not good enough, right? The trick is, do you as a company have the capacity to educate the people to those jobs? I mean, if the universities don't do a job, you should do it yourself, right? That's what we try to do at J.P. Morgan. I mean, all the graduates are stupid. Unless they're from Google. That's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is, this, no, but, 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 it, but it's, it, you know, it's, it, again, you know, do you invest in, you know, continuing education, right? I mean, what, what Horisan is doing here is phenomenal, right? Because, I mean, you know, when he started out 20 years ago, the Japanese said, what? I don't need to educate anybody. I'm good. You know, I tell them what to do and they do it. Great. Japanese people are very nice, right? Very gullible, right? Now, that's not good enough anymore. You've got to acquire skills that within the company you can't just acquire, right? And so, you know, this is, I mean, how many classes do they have right now? There's like 15 classes or something like that, right? This is cool. It was unthinkable before, right? But do you invest in this as a corporation, right? That's the key question. American companies are very catchy. We don't invest in our kids' education. You've got to do your own You're American. You've got to do it yourself, right? Which is why America has a lot of student debt, which Japan doesn't have. Please, you. Los Angeles. Very good. Well, why did you come to Tokyo? I like the food. Okay. <laughs> yes, okay. And what else? Uh, well, the reason is, is it, the focus uh, uh, on economics is, is now, of course, in the Asian markets. Right. And um, I've worked in a lot of American companies. I know how they do business. Right. And I'd like to see it done differently. Right. And so that's why I'm here. No, I mean, look, I mean, the proximity to Asia is phenomenal. Plus, Tokyo is, of course, you know, so when, when these, you know, when foreign investors come now, you know, there's these groups of people, you know, <clears throat> come to Japan for the first time, you know, and sometimes my opening line is, welcome to Tokyo. It's the only place in Asia with clean air, no traffic jams, and a banker who lends you 85% loan to value, <laughs> which nowhere in Asia is happening, right? So I hope that next week I don't have to add and be <laughs> anyway, that's not going there. Any other comment, question, you know, viewpoints? Please feel free to 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 talk. If you, if you if I can give you some advice, I'm very happy to do that. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Hideki. I'm working for some IT company. Um, what, what company? IT company. From some IT company. Yes. Well, yes. <laughs> IT company. As uh, <laughs> you're mentioning that um, uh, labor shortage is, which is fantastic. Um, so you don't need uh, you you do you think you don't think that we don't need to accept immigrants from other countries uh, for to solve that labor shortage? And then I googled you actually, and I found your wife is Kathy Matsui, and he who is supporting for Mimenomix. So I am curious. You are always debating in the house, and you can win the discussion or not. Trust me, we've got way more interesting things to talk about. Because <laughs> my wife is super cool. Uh, she is so cool. It's unbelievable. Because she's been doing this for a long time, you know. And I mean, this is very, very good. And so I was very happy. I don't know whether you saw. So I'm going to boast for my wife. She was just, you know, voted one of the 50 most influential people in the world. So, like, so it's like, good. 
was she having dinner with today? <laughs> <laughs> and she's having dinner with her team, actually. They're the young women, right? So you see that kind of case. Um, no, but the, 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 the whole point is immigration, OK? How many here are Japanese? <laughs> OK, so what's that? That's a third? <laughs> OK, now this is a university, right? But again, you know, when I was at you know, a university in Japan, right? I mean, maybe we were two or three gaiju, you know, some weird French guy who sort of studied Buddhism, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know, so, I mean, you know, society is changing. Now, Japanese politicians are very, very honest, right? Can you name a country that has a successful immigration policy? Does America have a successful immigration policy? It's a big political issue. Okay, America is a natural immigrant country, as is Australia. But there are big frictions. Singapore, is anybody here from Singapore? <laughs> Singapore, seven years ago, said we're going to double the population by open for immigration. The government is under serious threat now, right? Because the locals don't like it. Europe, I mean, these are, these are complicated debates, right, that you actually have. There is no perfect answer. So no politician in Japan right, will stand in front of a microphone and says, I want a big immigration policy. Right? But, and now comes the but, this country, extremely pragmatic. Extremely pragmatic. Look at the data. Where are we? Tokyo. Eight years ago, number of hi non-Japanese, right? was 3.1%. What is it today? 5.4%. When you go into a Lawson's or a 7-Eleven, as you know, this is the example everybody always uses, right? You find that basically everybody has just one kanji, right? So they're Chinese, they're Korean, they're Bangladeshi, they're... The other guy, there was a, there was a guy from Mongolia there. So it's fantastic, right? No, but, you know, the Japanese are very pragmatic. When I came as a student in 1985, on a student visa, I was allowed to work for 12 hours a week. Today, if you come on a student visa, you can basically work for 35 hours a week, which is as much as a Frenchman works normally. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm lucky you're not from France. No, sorry, I'm sorry to say, I always have to be a little careful, but we're all happy. You know, but so it's complicated. It's complicated, but it's also relatively easy. Do you know that technically Japan is now one of the easiest countries to get a Japan, to get a green card? Five years, right? Now, they're still Japanese. If during those five years, right, you had a parking ticket, you have to start again. You know, so they're very pedantic. They're still Japanese, right? <laughs> you like the details, right? But, you know, this stuff, I, I think, you know, when, it, when I bet you that the population of Tokyo, the non-Japanese population of Tokyo, by the time of the Tokyo Olympics, it's going to be in excess of 10%. This is going to go so fast, right? This is going to go so fast because this country, they actually do want to win. They are a contender, right? And they are very, very pragmatic, right? So it's good. I just need to hang on there a little bit longer. You know, maybe then I can become shut shut. Yes. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Oh, my friend. Though. So we work for the same company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I take care of the data center, power and cooling, so I can cut off. Yeah. <laughs> I cut the power, I can't do anything. <laughs> All right. So my question lies on the uh, the three arrows. You yeah. mentioned that uh, they have to be coordinated in order for uh, Benamis to be successful. Right. So we've got the uh, monetary thing yeah. is more concrete, the uh, fiscal spending concrete. The third arrow is, my question is on the third arrow, right. where it's the regulation and structural reform. Right. So. Uh, yeah, you've mentioned that uh, most of the investments are now in uh, other countries, right. and that's increasing, but there has to be a balance that investments also have to grow uh, domestically. So I've heard a comment in CNBC, I, I think it's also one of our employees in JP Morgan, he mentioned that the corporate tax has to go down to 25% in order to work. Right. So what is your kind of a comment on that? So what do you think? Do you think, okay, very good. First, do you think a cut in corporate taxes is going to trigger investment. What is the Japanese corporate tax rate? It's 38.5%, right? Um, 
38.5%. What's the corporate tax rate in the United States of America? 35%, right? What's the corporate tax rate in Germany? It was just cut, it's 25%, right? But, you know, empirically, right, there is no correlation between corporate tax rates and investment activity. Japan's, the corporate tax rate used to be 50% when Japan had one of the highest investments, you know, in the world. As a business person, I can set my tax rate, right? I mean, that's why I have accountants, right? <laughs> so, you know, it's not just taxes. What do taxes do? When you cut taxes, when you cut corporate taxes, what will happen? My analysts get extremely happy because a cut in corporate taxes will directly increase after-tax income, after-tax profits, right? So it's a great political economy, right? That yes, I want to get stock prices go up. I work for JP Morgan, we are an investment bank, we sell, sell stocks. So yes, you should cut corporate taxes because that will boost shareholders' return. But it is disingenuous, and there's lots of work done on this, right? A cut in corporate taxes does nothing to business investment. Precisely because, as you pointed out, why would you want to invest in Japan? Why would you build a factory in Japan? You would build a factory in Japan if there's a market, if your transportation costs are low, if you have access to engineers, right? That's what you would want to do. So what are they doing with the third arrow? They're trying to get investment into Japan. What investment are they focusing on? What are the areas, if you were to give advice to the prime minister, what industries, what businesses should he focus on? What do you think? What is the, what is Miryukiki? Pharmaceuticals, healthcare. If you give me a million dollars to invest in Japan, I want to build the Louis Vuitton hospital chain of Japan. <laughs> <laughs> healthcare spending, because that's the, the front end, or rather the back end, that's these 430,000 people who get older. As you get older, you need creature comforts. I want to be in that business. We reckon healthcare spending in Japan is going to grow at five times the speed of the national economy. That's a fantastic business to actually be in. Now, what have they done? Tokum, special economic zones, deregulating the pharmaceuticals market, right? The whole patent application or drug application process has dramatically changed. Japan used to have the slowest application process in the world, where basically if you had a drug trial and it was approved in America or in Europe, you could not transfer the drug into Japan. The Japanese would say, no, we gotta test it again because we are Japanese, you gotta test it on Japanese people because the stomachs are different, right? Remember that? <laughs> You know, that was changed. It's true. Oh, it's really true. Yeah, okay, really. Mm -hmm. Sure. How many eyes do you have? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's true that they said the stomach. No, they, the stomach is different. The snow is different. Rosignol, you, you, you know, you ski? They boycotted, you know, they, they forbade Rosignol from selling skis in Japan on the argument that the snow is different. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is. You know, anybody who's ever skied in Hokkaido, it's phenomenal. It's great. But it's called champagne powder. It's also true in the Rocky Mountains. You know, it's just it's a function of the temperature and <laughs> the, the snowfalls. You know, but you know, so the whole point is now they so they used to have this this very very protectionist, you know, drug approval process that was changed a year and a half ago. Now there are actually eight drugs since the beginning of the year. Eight drugs where worldwide Japan is the first market where that's going to. Right. So when they change, they can change very quickly. The political economy, by the way, the drug thing has also changed. Is anybody here working for a pharma company? Right? So if you look at the big Japanese pharma companies, Takeda, Chugai, yeah, their patents, right, have rolled off already. It's called the patent cliff, right? So basically the opposition from the large pharmaceutical companies, you know, has also died away. Right? It's kind of Germany. And political economy is very important. Why can Angela Merkel switch off the nukes? Because Siemens sold its nuclear power business three years ago. So of course, you know, the business connection, the lobbying against it is, is not that intense. Very difficult for Mr. Abe to say, we're gonna go X news. Because Hitachi and Toshiba bought two companies that actually specialize in nuclear power. Pretty quick, right? So maybe we have to sell them. 
in Vietnamese? <laughs> Who is Scott? Any other question? Comment? Who are you? What is this thing you have there? This is so cool. What is this? This is Russian. Uh, no, uh, yes, part of it is Russian. Uh, are you a, a space cadet? Um, I wish to be, but um, my name is Yusuke Teguchi and I work as an instructor for uh, astronaut training. You, you, really? Really? So you fly around and do these zero G things? I wish I could, but uh, we don't do that in Japan. <laughs> of course, Japanese, you know, you know, plans for being an astronaut with lead suit. It would be tough. <laughs> That's cool. That's very cool. Thank you. Why did you, how did you get into that? Well, I had uh, people who um, already worked there, and uh, they knew how I had some passion for this. But how did you develop a passion for... I mean, I can understand. Well, I grew up wanting to be an astronaut. You did? Yes. All right. And I still do want to. How many of you want to be an astronaut? How many of you want to fly, want to be in space? <laughs> Only three. Come on. Uh, okay, good, great, pragmatic. pragmatic. Yeah, yeah, very pragmatic. <laughs> That's awesome. And my God, look at the astronauts. And what are you, you're a globist now? Uh, no, I just come here to attend the seminar as much as I can. Wow. Okay, that's incredible. Sorry, that's just cool. Very, very long. You mentioned how Japan has been continuing to invest in um, R&D and, um, of course, making some innovative products, but I I'm sure there's always an argument that after the Walkman, maybe some special exceptions, but uh, there's not many innovative products that made a real change in the market. Maybe not something like the iPhone. Look, it's, or, yeah. What is it that Japan is missing? I think, look, you think about this, right? You're gonna be, okay, so the media, right? What do the media talk about when they talk about business? You talk about the stuff that is commercial and directly tangible, right? So a consumer electronic product is directly tangible because we use it every day, all the time, right? The other thing you talk about is finance, right? Because finance, whether you like it or not, every day you do something, something finance, you know, plus, you know, is very powerful. I mean, but, but it, it directly affects, you know, everybody, right? What else do you talk about? Media. Right? Japan is very bad, right? <laughs> at finance, right? And I'm going to make a comment on that in a second. It's very bad at media. Dentsu is nowhere. Sachi and Sachi, <laughs> everybody knows, right? For example, right? Um, you know, so what is your public awareness? When you talk to an engineer, Japan is heaven. And whether it's chemical engineering, whether it's product engineering, whether it is you know, components, whether it is pharmaceuticals, the Japanese are absolutely spectacular, right? And are complete top tier contenders. But in the mass market, right? The big brand mass market, right? The Japanese are not the players that they used to be. And that was really you know, the consumer electronics industry, which has been taken apart. But the components industry, right? The Japanese are very good at it. If you look at Sharp, if you look at Panasonic, which basically two years ago or three years ago were bankrupt, you know, they have now sold off their businesses, right? And are actually very, very competitive. You know, Panasonic has effectively become a batteries company, right? And you know, Sharp, you know, on the panel side, you know, is still very, very competitive now that they've actually cut, you know, uh, some of their uh, their excess capacity, you know, that they had before, right? The problem with Japan as an analyst, right? is that Japanese companies hate to have all bag, all eggs in one basket. They're very diversified. Car companies make cars, right? They're very specific. Other companies in Japan typically have at least three businesses that have nothing to do with each other, right? Because they diversify their risk, right? Which means that Kyocera, right? which basically does mobile phones, does printing devices, right? And what else do they do? Sorry, I forget, I have a blank note. Kyocera does one, one other thing. What, what else does Kyocera do? Huh? Cosmetics? No, no, not Kyocera. Not Kyocera. Uh, sorry, mobile phones, printing devices, and I forget. They do one other business, right? As an analyst, it's a complete disaster because always one business is great. The other business is so-so, and one business is loss-making. It's just the business cycle, right? 
As an analyst, I want somebody, okay, what do you do, right? I sell cars, great, I can analyze this. This is very good, what's your product palette, et cetera, et cetera. But if you've got another, you've, do, you've got to do constantly analyzing a Japanese company, you constantly are doing some of the parts. Hitachi Corporation has 168 you know, business lines. Last year, five of them made money. <laughs> now, Hitachi is changing, right? So it's quite interesting, right? That, but again, in terms of the overall competitiveness, my job as a stock analyst, if I am asked, how do I judge competitiveness? What you're really asking is, what's the shareholder return? That's what you're asking. But it has nothing to do with competitiveness, right? It's one measure, it's the return on equity capital, right? Engineering-wise, you've got the German car guys coming to Tokyo, and they say, oh my god, these guys, they do stuff we are not gonna be able to do for another 10 years. These guys do precision of one micron, where the German guys can do five micron. That's a huge difference that you have. So, to give you an answer, money can buy research. Turning research into money, the Americans are awesome. The Americans could turn nothing, Hollywood, nothing into money. This is nothing. A bunch of bozos talking, at least Charlie Chaplin, I mean, it's, it's hilarious, right? But it's awesome, it's cool, and you pay for it, right? I'm not, I'm not, not demeaning it, right? But the Japanese are turning you know, the research that they have into money is very true, right? Because they're the best engineers. If you're the best engineer, what do you do? You wait for the phone to ring. <laughs> because of course you're going to come in. Right? But marketing, I mean, the Americans can sell nothing. I mean, you know, look at this, the German thing. They can sell this, I mean, this is 9,000 miles away. It's made from, you know, 25 miles from where I grew up. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's completely ridiculous. When you think about it, but it's a problem. You know, it's like, you know, this is like, it's twice the price of this. How cool is that? Right? It's got twice the margin, right? And it's twice as expensive. And it's got transport, it's, it's, it's fun, right? The Japanese could never do that, right? It's a great opportunity. You should market Japanese sake. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot, I mean, you guys walk in the street, there's, there's, you see this stuff, my God, if we had that in the West, wouldn't that be great? Just do it. It's phenomenal, they can do it, right? Oh. Those are, who are you? We met before. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Maurice Rev, uh, attorney for Anderson Murray Tomosane. Uh, <laughs> so, You're my lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, you were talking earlier about the global investors in, in increasing here. What, what, do, what do you see, or two or three regulations or business practices that can change that can increase the number of global investors coming into Japan? You know, um, I think, you know, in terms of the, the, the business practices in the financial services industry, you know, actually the Japanese are now very, very transparent, you know, and, uh, you know, the rule and regulatory environment, right, is actually, you know, you know, very, very good. We don't, you know, none of the American companies, you know, considers Japan sort of dread big regulatory obstacles, you know, that you actually have in place, right? I think there are a couple of regulatory changes, you know, that basically go to the tax code, right? Where, you know, you could really make a difference, right? So for example, I mean, if your policy really is, you know, to get risk money to invest in Japan, right? And to get Japanese investors to invest in Japan, what you should have is netting, right? So if I have a stock, and I have a bond, and I have a mutual fund, by the Japanese tax code, if you have a loss in stocks, but a gain in your mutual fund, you cannot net one against the other, right? Most other countries have that, and you know, that's exactly, I think, the way it should be, right? So I think netting on the tax basis, right, I think is probably, you know, sort of the very, in the financial services industry, the most concrete thing, you know, that you actually have. Other than that, you know, it's, you know, I'm sure that in the pharmaceuticals industry, you know, there's still some obstacles, you know, uh, uh, that you have put in place, but 
basically when you look at the negotiations, right, uh, between Japan and the United States there, there's actually very little, right, um, you know, that is sort of blatantly obvious and on the agenda right now. So, do this guy. How many of you speak German? Really? How come? I'm, I'm Belgian. <laughs> You've uh, visited us. That's very good. You, have a, you, you could win the next World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 they have a very, they have a very young team. They're very good. They're very good. What about who you, you spoke German? You? You're Swiss. Okay, well, that is, that is good. That is very good. What are you doing here? In a logistics company, yeah. the Swiss logistics company. No, an Austrian and German. An Australian German. Austrian and German. Which group is in the company? Strategic alliance with Australia. Okay, very good, very very good. So, no more questions, no more comments, please. Ah, uh, konbawa. My name is uh, Morihiro. I'm from. Uh, I'm originally from Kyoto Prefecture. Oh. Um, working for an airline company. An airline company? Yeah. Japanese airline company? Yes. <laughs> okay, which one? Uh, <laughs> you can guess. No, I cannot guess. <laughs> I cannot guess because there's two, so two. I have to guess. <laughs> uh, well, the red one. The red one? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Good. The red one. Yes. You know what? The red one, right? Yeah. It was very funny. So when I, you know, you had this period, right? This was mm -hmm. way before you, yeah. right? Before you arrived and made things better. Uh -huh. You had this. So they, no. So, <laughs> so, so, I, so I get a job, right? And so you fly, start flying around, blah, 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 right? And so they put you in business class, da, 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 right? But at Japan Airlines, shoot. Uh, at Japan Airlines, <laughs> right? They really, they really, I kid you not, they had the smoking and the non smoking. The smoking was on the right side. <laughs> No one's going to do that. It was like, wow, only in Japan. Fantastic. That's so cool. Like, I hated it. <laughs> Foolish much. Now it's fantastic. It's like amazing. Amazing. Sumi wasn't it? Well, my question is uh, I actually attended um, seminars uh, related to homonomics. I mean, that's organized by your wife. And um, I thought that the ideas related to womenomics was great. And I really, I think the Japanese government really ser seriously should um, do something about it. But back into my company, um, in April, my company um, said that they, they're going to have female, more female board members, but they hadn't done it. It's like kind of everything's got to stop. <laughs> so I can feel that it's, well, I mean, I have to doubt if they are serious or not. <laughs> so what, what, what's the key to uh, actually, but yeah. It, it, I mean, you make a very, very good point, yeah. right? And I mean, this is a, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, right? The only thing I will say, right, is that whether you have a woman board member or not, you know, does not, you know, I mean, that's a nice symbol that you have. It's like Abe, you know, annoying everybody in the LDP by putting five women into the cabinet, right? <laughs> okay, so that's a symbol that you actually do, right? The real issue is bottoms up. It is at the line, right? Do you have career advancement, right? Do you have equal pay for equal work? Right? That's the real issue, I think. You know, and whether you can find women or whether you cannot find women. I mean, you know, just because we should promote women, therefore you should take somebody who is not very good, right? And there's very good women, women, and there's very bad women, right? There's very good men and there's very bad men, right? This is very complicated. The key issue is this cultural change that you really have, you know, equal opportunity. In my personal opinion, right? The problem is not so much rules and regulation. There are some rules and regulations, but they're mostly concerning about the tax code, right? That if you earn more than 1.3 million yen, right, your after-tax income actually starts to go down. You're familiar with that, right? 
The other issue is one that Japanese corporations basically still promote on the basis of seniority, not on the basis of performance, right? And if you promote on the basis of seniority, any outsider, whether you're an immigrant, whether you're a non-Japanese, or whether you're a woman, right, will not have a chance. I will give you an example. So, you know, so I'm, you know, every once in a while I get invited to be on these shinikai, right, on these government advisory councils, you know, and it's only, I mean, there's like two white guys left, right, so then, <laughs> so then you know, so you, you're sort of sitting there and then this debate comes on about immigration, right, and you see where I'm going with this, right, this thing about immigration, and they say, ooh, people like you, people like you, we welcome. People like you with a PhD. Uh, I'm sorry, I dropped out of the PhD program. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Ah, oh, but you know what I mean. You know, people with high qualifications. You know, this is what we want. Okay, interesting. So three years ago, a Japanese friend of mine calls me up and says, "Hey, hey, how are things going? Yada, right? Remember Hiroshi." Hiroshi is my son. Oh, yeah, we went sailing together a couple of times. Blah, blah, blah. How is he doing? Oh, Hiroshi is at MIT. And he's a graduate. Right? And he got a job offer. And he got a job offer from an American company, from a German company, and from a Japanese company. Can you give, can you give him a call? Can you give him some advice? Right? What did she do? So I said, ito -san. What do you want me to tell Hiroshi? <laughs> <laughs> because if you are good and lucky, you join the American company, you are good and lucky, in 15 years' time, you can become Shachu. If you join the German company, if you're good and lucky, in 15 years' time, you can be in charge of a region. Asia, Latin America, Europe. If you join the Japanese company and you're good and lucky, in 15 years' time, what's it going to be? Cut shot? You know, I mean, alpha people, male, female, makes no difference. High performers are high performers. They play in the major, not for the giants. I'm a hunching fan. <laughs> no, but, but, but you know, so this, this, so this Shanghai Bunka, right? Okay. Don't tell anybody I told you. <laughs> so, so I work for a multinational firm. I work for the biggest bank in the world, right? J.B. Moore, right? So we are in Tokyo, we've got about 1,400 people, right? And so a couple of years ago, we had this issue in tax accounting, right? And so the head of the office, right, an American at the time, right, nice guy, sensible, spoke Japanese, blah, 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 right? So we have a problem in tax accounting, so he goes around the different divisions. And so he says, hey, when you've got a problem with tax accounting, who do you talk to, right? Oh, Ishi-san, okay, goes to a different division, right? When you've got a problem with tax accounting, you go, oh, ah, Ishi-san, Ishi-san is awesome, right? So he goes around the major division, and basically it's like, you know, Jutten Manten, right? It's like ishi right? So we have the management meeting, right? And he says, okay, so we have this problem in tax accounting, right? What do you guys think of ishi -san? Oh, fantastic, he's awesome, right? Really, really, he's the best, that's the guy we go to. Okay, why don't we make ishi the butcher? Oh, no, it's impossible, we can't do that. <laughs> can, can possibly do ishi because, you know, there's Tanaka-san, who is three years senior, and he's in line. And this is at a multinational corporation. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's very interesting. Then you ask Ishi-san, he says, oh, I don't want to do that job. <laughs> because there's Tanaka-san, you know, and he's my son. <laughs> Which is, I mean, that's, that's, that's cool, right? It's like, wow. I was like, dude, hello. <laughs> anyway, so it's, it's kind of interesting, right? So we fired both of them. <laughs> no, no, we, we, I don't know what we did. <laughs> anyway, it was like, it's like you said. So these, these Americans, they go, they, 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 
<laughs> it's kind of cool. Yeah. So, you know, so this, this Shamai Bunka, right? Because you have this escalator system, right? Okay, I can, can tell you another story. You want me to tell you another story? Because the, the fun part of my job, right, is, is um, actually I, I really like recruiting, right? And the reason is that you know most of my department is sort of in their 30s and 40s, right? And then my kids are 14 and what did you always you know? Like you just turned 18, right? And so you know, so so I, I can deal with teenagers and I can deal with the, the the these people, right? But I know nothing about people in their 20s, right? Which is ultimately that's the future, right? That's sort of very tangible future, right? So we do the recruiting thing. Right, and so we do this thing, and you know, you apply. You have to take a test that I would probably fail, right? Um, <laughs> some web-based thing, um, and then we sort of select people, and then we sort of have 50 people, right, from you know Japan, right, uh, from the sort of top whatever 10 universities, eight universities, something like that, right, and then we have group interviews, right. So we basically have you know I forget eight people per interview or something like that, and there's myself, one of my juniors, and one of my seniors, right? And we sort of sit there, right? And it's hilarious. It's fantastic, right? Because everybody shows up, they all look the same, right? <laughs> they all, they've read this, you know, manual on how to do this thing, they have this black suit, you know, so I always say, the girl who is wearing a red dress, we will hire her. <laughs> you, see, you know, she is like, she dares to be different, right? But, then we sit down, right, and suddenly ya di da da you talk and you chat and you blah blah blah, right? And so after about 45 minutes, right, I switch into English, right? And I just say, hey, last time you guys went overseas, what was the funniest thing, what was the weirdest thing that happened to you? And it's just to test their English, right? The girls, yup, 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 yup. One year in England, one year in Australia, traveled around America, you know, like boo, 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 yeah? Most of them say they got fat, which is funny when they went overseas. <laughs> you know uh, but the guys, right, over the last five years, in total, less than 12% had spent more than a week outside of Japan. Why is that? Why is that? The reason is, when I talk about it with my Japanese friends, right? The reason is very simple. If you're a guy and you graduate from Todai, from Keio, from Waseda, blah, 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 you're on the escalator. Mitsubishi Corporation, I'm sorry if there's somebody here, a great company, but Mitsubishi Corporation will hire you, no matter what, <laughs> right? <laughs> now, the girls also, from the top universities, they also know, of course, Mitsubishi Corporation will hire me. But if I work for Mitsubishi Corporation, my career stops on the second floor. So therefore, the girls create alpha, right? So, you know, they speak English, they internationalize themselves, they create a competence, right? Which makes them very attractive. So I really love my job, because I get to hire a lot of girls. <laughs> so, so this is stunning to me, absolutely stunning. Right? You ask these guys, so when you interview with a Japanese company, what do you talk about? They don't care what subject they study. <laughs> oh, you're a member of the golf club. Oh, yeah. Tennis. So do you. So that stuff needs to change. Right? You want to play on the team? Are you good? How good are you? Can you challenge this? That's a great win, Lawrence. <laughs> Please. So who are you? You, 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 you smile. You have a very nice smile. Uh, yes, you do. Uh, let me introduce myself. You I'm may. half French and half German. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> very good. Um, I'm Persian. You're Persian? Yeah. You're kidding. From where? From Uzbekistan. You're from Uzbekistan? I am. Really? Uh, which, which country? Oh, have you been there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, from Uzbekistan. <laughs> which, which town? Which city? Uh, have you been there? I have been there. Oh, really? I was in Uzbekistan in 1974. 
Germans were allowed to travel to the Soviet Union. And my father, who is a nutcase, right, or was a nutcase, bless his heart, um, you know, he said, we must go now because who knows how long this lasts. So we spent four weeks, right, traveling around the, the, the Soviet Union. It was fantastic, right? In what age? I was, I was born in 1961. Okay. <laughs> so I was a pubescent. 13 year olds. <laughs> All right. Actually, my parents also studied German. I guess of course, because we it was the so second language we were allowed, yeah, oh, during the session. Uh, yeah, they were. <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Um, can I just have a paper to ask you a very personal question as an investor? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm from Samarkand. You're from Samarkand? Samarkand? Yeah. We were in Samarkand. Oh. Very beautiful. Samarkand. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you guys should go. It's a beautiful city. Yeah. Very good promotion. Thank you. <laughs> I'll pay for you <laughs> later. All right. Uh, can I ask you a very personal question as an investor? Very personal. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I just wanted to ask you about investment and in what fields. <laughs> I mean, in Japan, do you invest since? Uh, 1985, you said. <laughs> no, I mean, and what fields of investment did you find um, maybe not stable or it would be? No, no, no. I think it's a very, very fair point. You know, but look. And uh, yeah, but uh, can I go on with my question? Are you di diversifying your investments or are you investing in a one particular field? And are you investing only in Japanese market or also in other countries? <laughs> Sorry. No, but this is, this, is, no, no, I mean, this, is a, this is a very, very fair question, and it's, it's very, very difficult to answer. So, um, you know, in terms of the, the kitkatoshite, right? In terms of the outcome, it's a very diversified portfolio, right? Um, I have diversified my portfolio more as I got older, right? Because you know I want to lower the overall risk, right, uh, in the portfolio. Right? Um, you know, investments, you know, there are sort of different ways that you need to think about this, right? The first one you need to think about is what are your actual liabilities, right? So, you know, do you have to pay, right, for your kids to go to school? Where are they going to go to school? Is this a yen liability? Is it a dollar liability? Is it a euro liability, right? So you always need to figure out what are the liabilities, right? And how do I match the liabilities, right? The second thing is, in terms of investment, if you invest in public markets, right? So in liquid markets and the stock market, which is how I started out, right? Um, you know, the one rule is I never invest in a company where I have not met with the management. Because at the end of the man, I'm giving this guy or this girl, right, my savings. So I want to be able to look him or her in the eye, is he going to work for me, or is he going to just work to party in the Ginza, right? <laughs> um, no, but the, you know, so that's the, the second thing when you buy liquid you know, investments, right? You always have to ask yourself, if the stock goes down, pick a number, by 20%, will you buy more? It's very, very important. You're that convinced. I mean, you can, your timing, you will never pick your timing perfectly, right? That's an illusion, right? Oh, I bought at the bottom. Really? Jacob Rothschild, you know, who is one of the richest people in the UK, right? He was once asked, how did you make so much money? And he said, by selling too early. <laughs> because you can always, oh, it's going to go up more, right? But when you make the investment, you always have to ask yourself, if this goes down, do I want to buy more? Is it that good? Am I that convinced of the story? Right? The third thing is, as I got older and more interested specifically in Japan, right? Um, you know, private equity, which is to say these are people who are entrepreneurs. These are people who have an idea. They need an angel. Huh. 
things. So I figure the older I get, the more I should become an angel. You know, but you know, I can take the risk, right? Um, and you know, it's much more hands-on, right? And it's on a whole variety of businesses. I do not invest in technology, right? Because I don't understand it. And I think the barriers to entry are minuscule, right? I would never invest, right, in a technology manufacturing company because the, you understand Moore's law, right, will constantly wipe everything out. I would never invest in a cloud service company, right, because trust me, before I blink, it will be free, right? Um, anyway, so, you know, does that answer your question kind of a little bit? No, yes. And I've got lots of Google. <laughs> Never, I don't invest in countries I don't know. You know, I think you know you, you need to. Do you invest? What do you invest? Uh, I, I, I'm not. Yeah, thank you. That's good. You should. <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the other thing, I mean, you actually do need to do the work by yourself. If you read it in the Financial Times, I mean, it, it doesn't mean that it's a bad story, right? But I mean, it's, it has nothing to do with insider information, but trust me. I mean, there's very clever people who do very hard work, right? Trying to figure out whether things make sense or not. Right? They don't always get it right, but by the time you read it in the Financial Times or in the Nikkei, you know, there's, you know, there's behavioral science investment now where people actually just scan chat rooms, you know, newspaper articles, and they basically gorge, right? If, you know, if there's more than 50% of the people, you know, talk strongly or bullish, you know, on a company, you know, you sell the company, right? And that tends to work very well, right? So, does that make sense? Some account. They've got this great tea drinking culture, or they used to. Maybe it has all changed. The Soviet Union, they were all sitting around talking about mathematics. Any other question, comment? Toriska. Hi. Okay, my name is Satoshi. Uh, I'm a French Japanese, actually. You're French Japanese? And I'm working for a French company. Really? Which one? Uh, Saint Gobain. It's a glassmaker. Yeah, fantastic. A little bit more than 35 hours. Yeah. Think, uh, Okay, um, in fact, I was wondering in your presentation, because you mentioned about uh, basically three things. Uh, the first one is alignment of the politician, which is indeed something that we haven't yeah. seen since a long time. Uh, the one, uh, I think the second one is better utilization of, of capitals. And yeah. the third one is um, these people, basically, these 30% uh, of, the, of the working people yeah. who are part time, and they will come back in the economy and they will fuel yeah. back the economy. But why this will bring Japan at the uh, top tier? basically level compared to China or to Korea? It's funny, I never said that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, top tier, you make a very good point, right? So I am very bullish, right? Now, in terms of GDP, right? Over the next five years, what is the average growth rate that Japan's economy is gonna generate? So I am one of the bullish people, right? I think it's going to grow on average one and a half to 1.8 percent. That is the bullish case. The IMF and other people who you know pretend to do this stuff, but 0.8 is the number they come up with, right? So it's not a high growth economy. But I'm not interested in GDP growth, right? As an investor, right? as an investment banker, as an analyst, I'm interested in the rate of return, in the profitability, right? Now, the issue, whether an increase in profits will leave the middle class behind and create this gap, the rising gap in incomes, shotoku kaksa, shisan kaksa, that risk is obviously not zero. Right? But in Japan, if I'm right with the labor market, right, and you do get this new middle class, you can actually have the best of all worlds. Right? Now, let me ask, let me let me tell you one other thing I didn't talk about, right? Which is the people who are retiring, the Mick Jagger generation, 
right? The baby boomers. Do you know that they are unbelievably rich? <laughs> Here's a wonderful statistics. So the Dunkai, right? The baby boom generation, they entered the workforce in the early 1980s. They took out a mortgage in the mid to late 1980s, and that was a very bad investment, right? With the price of real estate collapsing. But Japan never disenfranchised, never broke the contract with the baby boom generation. They kept their job, they were not fired, and the banks did not foreclose them. They were not thrown out of their houses. So they paid back their mortgage, which was kurushi. It's a balance sheet recession. Did not feel very good, right? So that was the 1990s and, you know, until a couple of years ago. Now, that debt has been paid back. The baby boom generation is retiring debt free. Do you know that in Japan, of the people over the age of 20, 44% of all Japanese over the age of 20 have no debt, but own the home that they live in. So they're very asset rich, right? So the assets are there to pay for the young generation to change their diapers. Sorry, I mean that's being too blunt, right? So that generational transfer is actually happening. So I am, in my day job, I only care about corporate profits. That's my job. As an economist, or as somebody who observes societies, the question is how stable is this thing? Is this thing fair? Stability? This place? Awesome. I had the worst collapse of asset prices since the Great Depression. Japan destroyed more wealth from the collapse in real estate prices and from the collapse in the stock market than Japan lost during the Pacific War. But the unemployment rate never went above 6%. Never did I have to worry about social unrest. It's a great system. Stock prices have fallen, and now when you look at valuations, they've actually adjusted, right? So, you, you know, do you invest? Why would I invest? I'm sorry, if you look at China, high growth, no margins. High growth, no profit. Why would I invest in that? Japan, low growth, rising margins. Ah, many growth goes south and south. Right? So, you know, GDP is not the measure. GDP is the wrong measure. It's an accounting concept that keeps economists busy. Right? <laughs> you know, it's, you don't invest in economies. You do not invest in economies. Oh, I want to invest in Greece. No, no, you don't invest in Greece. What do you do? You want to speculate in the government bond market? Come on, that's a different issue. Right? You invest in companies. You invest in management. You invest in intellectual property. You invest in systems. You've got a great idea. Can you deliver? Can you procure the capital? Can you procure the salespeople? God damn it, my suppliers suck. My web strategies are designed. I mean, what, what, whatever. I mean, that's what you guys are studying, right? Here it goes. Yeah, but if I, in this case, you say a, a, a walk so that uh, there's maximum cap, I mean, uh, capital coming to the stock market in Japan because the uh, companies are doing great. And you say, in addition, the economy is very stable. It will be uh, improving because uh, we'll, be, we'll be able to, to I mean, the, there's a huge part of the population that has not been contributed to the economy, which come back, so it's good. But in the end, uh, as you say, there's less and less active people. That means. The, the human capital is decreasing. That means for company, they have when you say R and D is important, R and D is uh, is uh, that means it's people, it's university, etc. But the population is decreasing. So, in the very long term, as you say, in the in, in the long term, basically the the the, 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 the population decreasing. That means the the, the, the R and D capability should be decreasing. No, 
sensitive. This, in the very long term, as one, somebody very famous once said, you know, you're, you're just going to be dead, right? <laughs> look at what's happening. No, but look at what's happening. So if this, okay, I'm, I'm going to put on my rosy glasses. Yeah? So there's a new middle class, right? The boys and girls get jobs, right? The girls and your boys get treated fairly, right, and get paid according to merit, right? They're going to start to marry. The government is going to provide Hori Kuen and Yo Chien services as our individual companies. By the time of the Tokyo Olympics, Japan's population is going to start to be growing, at least for the young core, because everybody's getting married, and they all want to have lots of sex. Oops, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> I, I would agree that we invest my money in Japan up to the Olympics, and then after, I mean, it's like, it's like China. China up to the Olympic was great because we knew that it was no, no, great. No, 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 no. But, but, but there is a huge economic difference between Japan and the People's Republic of China. And this is objective analysis. Japan got rich before it got old. This is not true for the People's Republic of China. If you want to talk about issues in terms of pension sustainability, in terms of you know healthcare sustainability, this is very tricky, right? High growth doesn't mean anything. It just means that there's high growth. You know, anybody can grow high. You know, when my kids were very small, they grew much faster than I did. <laughs> if you start from point one, you know, point two is a double. It's like really, I'm huge. I'm sorry, no. I'm, you know, the, the, this is this is a big thing. What are you going to do? Compete against Toyota? Good luck. Ooh, Hyundai. Hyundai. Okay, Hyundai? Hyundai. Oh, Hyundai's a big threat to Toyota. Really? Toyota sells 2.8 million cars in America. Hyundai sells 150,000. Really? I mean, Tesla. No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, you're from Korea. No. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. I knew it. scary as Samsung, for example, you know, you look at capacity, you know, of, of, of mobile phones, for example, right? When you think about, you know, the, 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 the you know, where, where, where Korea created, after the Aja Tsukakiki, right, after the Asia currency crisis, Korea created national champions, right, with eight companies, no, we're going to make that into two, you know, and so you get economies of scales, right? That's exactly what has happened, right? The question is, I mean, in our, in the opinion of, do I have a question? <laughs> in the opinion of J.P. Morgan, we think Samsung is the next song. We think Samsung is that, right? But you know that's what my expert is saying. You know, and it's, 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 it's effectively that now you have from the People's Republic of China, right? You're going to have increases in competition, increases in production capacity, right? And when you look at the price difference, right, between a Samsung phone and a smartphone in the People's Republic of China for similar functions, right, similar capacity. Right? It's one tenth of the price. Good luck. Samsung is not Apple. So the Americans are smart because they don't do that stuff. They connect the dots. I mean, how many of you fell off your chair laughing when you saw that Apple presentation a couple of weeks ago? Oh, and by the way, we're going to introduce a revolution. We're going to introduce Apple money. How long have you had a safe okay time? Right? You've had this for a long time, for 10 years. But in Japan, it's fragmented. Right? Electric money in Japan, you know, from Suica card, I mean, this, this is enormously fragmented. What Apple is going to be successful at, this is going to work. Because they will pull it together. They create the standard. The problem with the Japanese is that they don't create the standard. They do it in cars. We all do hybrids now. People laughed at Toyota. Now, that was good engineering. But pulling things together, Apple is a cult, when you think about it. It's exactly a cult. You, 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 you plug into the system, you're done. You can't do anything else. Sony never created a cult. Nice product. Products don't last. Thank you very much.
I wish you good luck in your career and in your studies. If there's anything I can do, please don't be shy. Thank you. Thank you.